Fun and follow creativity is a succinct tagline that lays out Kickstarter's mission and purpose. That includes creating an entirely new crowdfunding model that has changed how financial pledging is done and who is engaged in it. Kickstarter does, doesn't just follow creativity, it is also a leader in art support, marketing, and audience building. Yancey will tell you the details of their startup, about three guys with the right idea at the right time, and a willing international community ready to jump into the game. Just three and a half years after launching Kickstarter, it has handled more than 32,000 successful projects and has paid out more than $388 million. The extraordinary speed of its success points the way towards a 21st century version of patronage that gives contributors of every economic background a hand in the finished product. A real-time relationship between artists and audience that creates mutual interest, meaningful engagement, and increasingly empowers makers to be entrepreneurs. U.S. labor statistics report that nearly 60% of artists and others in related fields are self-employed a trend that we see in our own alumni surveys at MCAD, where most of our, a significant percentage of our graduates go on to create their own businesses, some of which were successfully launched through Kickstarter. As Dara mentioned, we're also fortunate in Minnesota to have MNArtist.org, which giving, giving so many artists a high profile web preference, or presence as well. So we see that this independent business flows not just from artists' own creative vision, but from a central lesson that we and other arts organizations must teach that making a living as a creative entrepreneur requires a vision, special determination, and a community to make it happen. A person with that special determination is our speaker today, Yancey Strickler, co-founder of Kickstarter. He has personally backed more than 600 projects. He's a former music journalist for Pitchfork, The Village Voice, and eMusic, and he's a graduate of the College of William and Mary. It is our pleasure today to welcome Yancey Strickler for his first public talk in Minnesota. This is by far the fanciest thing I've ever done, just for the record. <laughs> this is all really weird. Uh, thank you guys for the great introductions. That was incredibly nice. Um, thanks to uh, everyone for being here. Super cool. Um, hope everyone got to go to the shop and see uh, the people showing their projects. If you are one of those creators, you want to raise your hand, just identify yourself. So all these people made things, and they're here. Um, you, should go, you should go check them out. Uh, I was also just seeing the, the midnight party show that's happening right now. That was pretty awesome. I uh, didn't get to finish it, unfortunately, but you should see that too. Um, but so uh, my name is Yancey. I'm one of the founders of Kickstarter. I'm also the head of community there. And I want to talk a little bit about um, what Kickstarter is, some of the things that we think about it, some of the things that you can think about uh, as you're using it, uh, and then just talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, so just to start at the very beginning, Kickstarter is a funding platform for creative projects, and um, it's a place where people make films, they make records, they make art, they do photography shows, designs, um, pretty much anything creative. We have a few rules on the site. Um, everything has to be a project, meaning it has a, a concrete beginning and an end. At some point, you can check a box to say that it's done. Uh, everything has to be creatively based. We don't allow charities. We don't allow causes. We don't allow you to fund your life. Um, <laughs> People try, and uh, and everything has to fit one of the one of the thirteen categories in the site. We'll, we'll talk about what those are in a minute. Um, there is a trick to Kickstarter, uh, which is that all the funding is all or nothing. So when you create a project, one of the two of the first things we ask you to do is say how much money you want to raise and give yourself an amount of time to do it. The average project picks about thirty days. Um, so in the case of this project, this is a live project here in Minneapolis. Um, you can see it's trying to raise thirty-two hundred dollars. Has four days to go. So right now it's about fifteen hundred dollars short. So if no one else pledged to this project, no one would be charged. Uh, Jennifer wouldn't get any money. The show may or may not happen, and everyone would just walk away. Um, but when a project is uh, down to the wire like this, it is always funded. Uh, it is pretty much always funded. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but um, there's a lot of momentum that'll carry a project through to the end. But this all or nothing funding thing is a really key part of how Kickstarter works. 
And so all together, um, you know, Kickstarter is this creative universe of lots of different kinds of things. There are 13 categories in the site. You can see them all here on the right. So you have a, a comic book artist sitting next to a chef, sitting next to a musician, sitting next to a documentary filmmaker. And they're all sharing in the space in the process of creation. And, that, and that's, what, that's what the site's all about. Um, Minnesota, uh, it's, it's exciting to be here. It's my very first time in, in Minnesota, Minneapolis. So the snow was exciting. So you guys did not disappoint. Um, but Minnesota is the 12th largest uh, state in the country by dollars pledged. Minneapolis is the 14th largest city in the world by dollars pledged. So these are, these are big hubs uh, for Kickstarter and creativity. And there have been a lot of great projects here. Um, there was a project uh, by a guy named Jamie putting uh, weather balloons into space. This is a really cool one. A um, uh, thing called Motion Poems, where a, a, an art, an animator, and a poet were turning poems into these little three-minute vignettes. We actually showed a couple of these in our Kickstarter Film Festival this past year in, in New York. Um, this is a really cool installation here nearby, these boom boxes put together. Um, there's also been a lot of public art, uh, a bunch of shows. There's also a restaurant, the Lynn, which I'm told I should try, but I, I, uh, maybe that's possible tonight. Uh, so it's a restaurant starting. There's been a number of restaurants in New York as well. Um, this is a, a, a graphic novel and comic book by uh, Zach Sally, who's, I knew him as the bass player of Low, um, and he also is a, is a comic artist, and, and this was a, a work that he did. Actually, earlier today at, at MCAT, I showed this project, and I talked about how I, I myself backed this project, and, and in my package with my books, I got a note card that said, uh, Dear Yancey Strickler, what a great name. You know, love Zach. <laughs> and, you know, I really, like, I love his band. I thought the project was super cool. He wrote my name down. That was, that was awesome. So I saved that and put it on my bulletin board. And he was at the talk earlier. He's, he's a teacher at MCAT. I had no idea. Uh, so that was, that was a nice little moment. Uh, there's also been a lot of just, you know, just straight up art. This is a show here in Minneapolis. Uh, another one, this was a performance that happened here at the Walker. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a huge, wide-ranging world of creativity. Um, and all together, just, just in Minneapolis alone, there have been over 400 funded projects. Almost 60% of them have been successfully funded. Uh, for the rest of Kickstarter, it's 44% of projects that are funded. So you guys are really good at this. Um, and, and all together, these 400 projects, it ends up to over $4 million that has come into the, the economy here in, in Minneapolis, to, just to artists, from over 50,000 people from around the world. So you think about all that money funneling into this one place, this one community, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and that works out to about $12 per person here, so you guys should share. Um, but so you know, that, that's a story here in Minneapolis, and it's the same for a lot of cities uh, all, over the, all over the country. Um, you know, the, the, largest, the largest city in terms of projects and money is New York, second is LA, third is San Francisco, but pretty quickly it gets to Austin, it gets to Nashville, it gets to Athens, Georgia. Um, these places where there are these real community creative communities and, and just a lot of love in the world for them. Um, and, and you know, the history of Kickstarter is, is, uh, is an odd one. Um, our CEO and, and my partner and my friend Perry Chen uh, first had the idea for Kickstarter in 2001. He was living in New Orleans and he wanted to put on a concert uh, during Jazz Fest and he didn't have the money to do it, he didn't have the means of the organization and, and so he just never ended up going through with this thing. And about a week later, He's really struck by this thought that he knew that people would have wanted this show to happen. He knew it could have happened if only he could have just asked them. And if only he could have invited them to just pay up front and people would only be charged if everyone agreed that it was a good idea. Um, so he had that idea and, and he himself was not sure to do with it. He was an assistant in a, a recording studio, um, just sort of hanging out. And he and I met in New York in, in 2005. Um, I was working as a music journalist, uh, as was mentioned. And I met Perry when he was working as a waiter in a restaurant where I went a lot. And then we were introduced to a friend of ours, a graphic designer named Charles. And the three of us started working on this thing. Um, but none of us know how to code. We're just people with a lot of thoughts in their heads and, uh, and not business people either. So it took a really long time to get the thing going. So from the moment we, the three of us started working on it, it was about three years before the site launched. And it wasn't for lack of trying. Um, but in April 28, 2009, the, fights, the, the site finally launched. Uh, it was really exciting. And since then, over 75,000 projects have launched through it. Over 30,000 have been successfully funded, 44% of them. So these are 31,429 things out in the world either they're either made or in the process of being made. 
um, and, and all through the contributions of a lot of people like us. Um, so all together, it's been almost 3 million people who have backed a project on Kickstarter. It's about 750,000 of them have backed more than one. So we think of a lot of people come to back, you know, their friend, their niece, their nephew, um, someone they went to college with, and they start looking around and they see other things to get involved in. And so that, that repeat number is one that we look at a lot. And then the, the money that's come through is really staggering, almost $400 million, you know, during, during the, great, the Great Recession. During the Great Recession, people have $400 million to spend on art and creativity and quixotic art projects. You know, it's, this is what the rational, the rational world, Adam Smith would tell us, this is not possible. Um, but this is something that we all desire and that, and that we're supporting. And, and we think this is something to really feel proud of for everybody, for everybody. Um, but all, all these numbers that I've shared are actually all publicly available. Uh, we have a, a page on our site, kickstarter.com slash help slash stats, that has all of our numbers just there to see. Um, every time we deploy code to the site, which is a few times a day, uh, this page updates with whatever the exact numbers are at that moment. We, we really view Kickstarter as this experiment. You know, we had this notion that this thing might work, kind of crossed our fingers that it would, and we're still figuring it out as it goes. So for us, making this stuff available so other people can look at it too, and maybe we can still learn, learn some things about you know, the generosity that we express and the kinds of things that we value. And you can even zoom in a little bit. You can expand any of these to see exact categories, what's going on. So here you can see that film is the biggest category in terms of dollars, almost $100 million to films alone. Then it's games and all the way down to dance, poor dance. Uh, <laughs> but still, still, that's $3 million to dance, $3 million to dance. And if you, if you go over all the way to the right, you see the success rate for dance. 70% of dance projects successfully raise their goals, the highest, the highest amount on the site. Um, so, you know, there's maybe not a lot of money, but they're, they're fierce when they get in there. Um, and so you can look at this page and you could, you can pull out your calculator and, and you could do a little bit of math. You could see things like 89% of all the money goes to successfully funded projects. Those first two numbers together are really interesting. So less than half the projects succeed, but 90% of the money succeeds. So what this says is that people either make their goal or they get very little. There's little in between. And there's, and there's a way that that makes sense. People either like ideas or they don't, or they're willing to fight for them or they aren't. And so there's a nice way where it just sort of separates things. Um, and that the bottom one is, is especially exciting. If a project reaches 60% of its goal, it has successfully uh, reached its goal 98% of the time. So that project we showed earlier, the dance performance here in Minneapolis that needs $1,500 the next four days, it is extremely likely to do it. It's extremely likely to make it. Um, so we like to talk a lot about, a lot about stats uh, at Kickstarter. I mean, what we care most about on the site are, the, are stories, but, but stories are things that um, we learned especially early on when we would talk very sincerely about the things people were doing. Stories are, either, are easy to brush aside. It's like, well, you know, that's a nice thing for that person. Um, but numbers are, are what people really see how real this is. And, and so we like to highlight those things as much as we can. And we're looking at the games category on Kickstarter. And games means video games. It means uh, board games. It means card games. It means dice, dice games, whatever people want to do. Um, and last year, a little over $3 million was pledged to games on the site, which is really, really cool. And a lot of that went to board games. There's been uh, close to 600 board games made on Kickstarter. We were at a board game convention. Uh, about a year and a half ago, and we were talking to someone there, and, and they said to us that Kickstarter was the first thing to change the board game industry since 1970, and that immediately became my favorite thing that I'd ever heard, ever heard about Kickstarter. Um, but there's a couple guys here with, uh, uh, who have a project here they're showing that's great, and, and um, you know, there are a lot of people who just haven't had the means to get their thing out there to the world before, and now they have that channel. Um, so this has been the year of the game, over $50 million to games this year. Um, and, and it's actually, this, this graph's about a month old, it's over $60 million now. Um, and I want to show you a little montage of some videos uh, that will explain why that's been happening. Salutations. I'm Joshua E.C. Newman. I'm Luke Peterschmidt. My name is Jay. And I'm Tiffany. I'm Neil Stevenson. Hi, I'm Jake Lewandowski. And I'm Matt Lewandowski. Hi, we're the men who wear many hats. It's another hat. Hello, America. I'm Tim Schaefer, and I'm a man of many passions. And we make video games. When we went to PAX, what was the number one question we were asked? Is it a billion dollar franchise? Probably not. 
then I can't help you. So you're turning down a game that the fans want. Well, screw that. It's the sum total of every expressive medium of all time made interactive. Like, how is that not? It's awesome. I hope to make something strange and unique for you to enjoy. I can't think of anything more boring than doing something for the sole purpose of making money. We really love games, but we feel like a lot of the current crop of mainstream games has been sort of polluted by money um, and catering to the lowest common denominator. And, um, we want to do something different. And we want to do it without any pesky publishers telling us to dumb it down or to make it tamer so we can get it into Walmart. Okay, let's talk about a few minor tweaks. All right, well, I don't want to stray too far from the original. Oh, no, no, I mean, these are just tiny modernizations, if you will. Take, for instance, uh, we would like it to be a first-person shooter. Excuse me? In our numbers, people, they tell me romantic vampires are really big right now, and we feel like they would seamlessly fit into the Wasteland storyline. Maybe we should use birds as weapons. Ooh, that's good, that's good. I'm glad we're on the same sheet of music. We didn't want anybody, any outside influence holding the purse strings on this. We wanted to design a game that, that we really felt passionately about. And it's not just a game, like, it's, I'm, I'm so closely attached to it. And this is my identity. I've got a shot at making the video game that I've been dreaming about. I'm confident that we can make it really, really awesome. So, you know, you see a lot of people who have all this passion, all these ideas, and other people are controlling the purse strings, they're, they're strangling the, the funnel. Um, they really don't have that opportunity to go out and, and do their thing. And for them, Kickstarter is just this canvas, this place where they can tell their story, where they can express themselves, where they can put an idea out in the world and just see what people think, just see what people think. And, and for games, it all really began this year with this project. This is uh, Double Fine Adventures, created by a guy named Tim Schaefer. And, and, um, and, and Tim is a, a, a game designer, game creator, but he's a real outsider. He, he's had a lot of success, and he has a really fervent following, but he doesn't make games that make money. And for that reason, he doesn't matter. He doesn't matter. You know, even this guy who has a huge following um, struggles to get things made because he doesn't make games like what that eight-year-old kid was asking for in that video. Um, and so this project launched in February, February 10th of this year. In the first 24 hours, this project raised a million dollars. Um, first time that it ever happened. And, uh, and interestingly, that same day, just two hours before Double Fine crossed a million dollars, a project crossed a million dollars for the very first time. We'd never had one in the first almost three years, and suddenly we had two within two hours of each other. Um, and we had a very big party that night. And uh, <laughs> we did, we did. Um, so 90,000 people came together to make this game. You know, everyone in the world saying to this guy, no, people don't care, you can't do that. And he just, he speaks directly to the world. And 90,000 people say, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. It's, in, it's continued with games. It's continued with games. This is a project that ended uh, just a week ago. Um, another, another studio with a big fan following. Um, you know, people who wanted to make a game their own way. This is now the largest game on the site, almost $4 million. And, and this has been a, a year of a, a lot of these million dollar projects. There have been 16 of them since February. Um, this is one, Amanda Palmer, um, whose husband, Neil Gaiman, is a, a, a local. Um, but she raised $1.2 million, and she doesn't have a record label, uh, but she put this out directly to her audience, and, and in September, this debuted at number 10 on the Billboard chart. It's not bad. We also had a million-dollar project here in Minneapolis, uh, Smart Things. This raised $1.2 million. This also ended just, just about a month ago. So these projects have been, have been reaching this enormous scale and, and reaching lots and lots of people. People are coming together around these things in a big way. And, and we're certainly excited uh, by what this means and that it means that this is a platform that a lot of people can use um, that's good for ideas that are both really big and really small. Um, but also, these things aren't really us. These things aren't really us. Um, this is the Kickstarter team. This is us. There's 46 people who work at Kickstarter. This is a couple months ago, so it's not quite everybody. Um, this is actually us in a, in a building in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, which is a weird Polish neighborhood in North Brooklyn. Um, and this is a building that we bought. Um, tech companies don't normally buy buildings, um, but we, want, we like the idea of having a permanent home. 
And so uh, it's a historical building. It's an old pencil factory. This is all of us visiting it for the first time and seeing it. It's really, really big. Uh, we don't plan on being very big, but it, it just worked out that way. But this is the team. About half the team works on um, designing the site and building it and thinking about how it should work. And the other half, which is the half that I lead, um, works with project creators and looks at projects all day and, and helps people and does customer service and things like that. Um, this is a really, really good group of people, and, and, and we're all uh, doing it because we believe in it. Uh, this is our office now. Uh, this is where we've been for the past three years. This is a tenement building in the Lower East Side of New York. So it's three floors of an old building from 1905. Uh, before we moved in three years ago, there was a millinery on the first floor and a photographer studio on the third floor. We've slowly kind of taken it over. But it has really rickety stairs and ten ceilings, and you'll see a little bit more of it a little later in, in the presentation. Um, but this is this is who we are. This is this is where we come from. We're we're a scrappy group. Um, you know these these projects in these huge numbers and it, it makes the site seem like it makes us maybe seem like something that we're not but um, you know we're still filled with with wonder and awe at everything that's happening and, and we think a lot about this this is the very first project to be successfully funded so the site launched April 28 2009 this was funded May 3rd, 2009, so six days later. It's a guy in Long Island. His project was, tell me something that you want to have drawn, and I'll draw it for you. <laughs> Three people did it, 35 bucks. This is Kickstarter. This is it. This is it. And so this is, this is the heart of what we are. This is much closer to what Kickstarter is than any of those million-dollar projects. The average project, the average successfully funded project raises about a little over $5,000 from 85 people. So at the end of it, you can remember almost all of your backers' names. You will probably have personal interactions with all of them. It is a community. It is a community. Um, but so we look at every project on the site. There's uh, between 100 and 150 projects that launch a day. Um, and our team looks through each one of them. And we do it for uh, both because it's work, but really because we love it. And, and we really look at the Kickstarter side as like its own medium. It's a form. It's a form that people are putting their ideas into and that they're playing around with. And because we look at everything, we, of course, really like the people who play around with it. And I want to show just a couple of those projects. Um, people who are doing the meta Kickstarter, playing within the form as itself, are, are awesome. So this is a this is incomprehensible if you're not on the internet every day, and I apologize. <laughs> Congratulations to you if you're not, and I apologize. This is an image for a project. Detroit versus painting a meta Kickstarter. What does that mean? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this is a project. The creator here is named Loveland, but it's, it's this guy named Jerry Paffendorf. And uh, Jerry is a madman. He's a madman, and he is the most prolific creator in Kickstarter history. He's had 37 successfully funded projects. Um, I, I actually had breakfast with him like a month before the site launched. Somehow we knew someone in common, and he pitched us on this crazy idea he had to remake Detroit. Um, and it's what he's doing. All of his projects are based in Detroit. They're all this weird mesh of civic and performance art and public art and then just crazy internet things. Um, and this guy, I think, really kind of embodies the spirit of Kickstarter. Put it up. Try to make it happen. Just do it, you know. And he just does it all the time, all the time. There's, like, not a waking moment that he's not have a Kickstarter project going. Uh, awesome guy. Awesome guy. Love Jerry. Um, but the very first uh, meta Kickstarter project was by Charles Adler, my co-founder. Um, Charles did this project with a, a famous graphic designer named Nick Felton to redesign Kickstarter's graphics. But you see, early on, we're trying to play around with, with the idea of, of Kickstarter. Um, I was the second person to do a, a meta Kickstarter project. Um, my project was that I would make a t-shirt that would have on it the finished stats of the project itself. So there are 532 people out in the world who have a shirt that has $532, $8,554 written on it. Why? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it was really fun. It was really fun. I really liked, I really liked the idea. And so did someone else. Uh, a couple months ago, someone launched a copycat project, um, which I was kind of excited about and glad that he raised less money than me. Um, <laughs> sorry, Ethan. Uh, it's so a lot of these, Kickstarter's Guide to Kickstarter. Um, a lot of these make it, some don't. That's always a little sad. Um, here's a Kickstarter to make a Kickstarter video. Uh, this was successful. 
This was a project whose goal was to be unsuccessful. Um, so the first Kickstarter strange loop, I love the, the windowing and the project image there. The goal of the project was to have an unsuccessful project. Um, yeah, you can see it right here. This is art school, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> You could read the first sentence of the $1 reward is against the conceptual basis of this project for anything tangible to be gained by participation. You don't say. Um, we really love this. I backed this project. Uh, this is also a great one. What is conceptual art, a conceptual art project? Um, at the end of this, he's going to write Kickstarter a letter and ask us to explain to him what conceptual art is. Uh, most of the Kickstarter staff backed this one. Um, there's also a museum of non-visible art featuring James Franco. <laughs> So James Franco launched a project to do this. He uh, later appeared on the Jimmy Kimmel show, and they gave him a lot of shit for it. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a form to, it's a form to play around in. Someone wanted to launch a Kickstarter to buy Kickstarter. <laughs> we, did a not, we did not allow him to launch this, which made him very mad. Um, it's just it's not enough money. It's not enough money. Um, and so... And so what you're, what you're seeing here is you're seeing people using the form of the page, the, the video, the image, the, the notion of, uh, of rewards, and all these things and putting them together into a structure. It is a known structure that you can use to make jokes. That is a crazy thing. That is a crazy thing to us. Um, back during the Republican primary, The Daily Show made this, Kickstopper. Uh, this is a page for Newt Gingrich's uh, campaign for president. And um, there were... Two great rewards. One was for like $10 billion. You got an apartment on the moon colony that he was going to build. Um, and then the, the best of all was that for $100,000, he would divorce you while you suffered from the terminal illness of your choice. <laughs> the Daily Show does not pull punches. Um, someone made a project to illustrate Breaking Bad. Uh, this is a dark one. This was by an ITP program at NYU. It's a, uh, they create a social vigilante site using Kickstarter. So this is to, to take down Joseph Coney. There are a lot of things like this, so a little darker. Um, someone tried to use Kickstarter rewards to explain the New York Times paywall plan, which is very, very confusing. Uh, so just they're viewing this as like an information architecture system, which was exciting for our team. Um, McSweeney's did a project, a Kickstarter project, to save Greece. Um, there's the Olympia Dukakis level, the Michael Cheeklis, and the Telly Savalas. I was in for the Telly Savalas. Um, but the one thing that all, these, that all these jokes get right is the importance of rewards. You know, they're all focusing on the structure of rewards, this tiered set of things. And, and rewards are really important for projects. Um, you know, the, the most typical rewards are, you know, I'm writing a book and you get a copy of the book, or I put your name in it, or, or I name a character after you, or I do a reading in your home, things like that. And, and so these rewards are the way that you really draw people in. So you make it so that it's not just about you, it's about everybody. Uh, we have a tenet that a successfully funded project should benefit everyone, not just its creator. Um, the image that you see in the back of this, this Polaroid, uh, this is my favorite reward that I've gotten from a project. Uh, very early on, there was a, a woman named Emily Richmond um, who launched a project to sail around the world alone. And she's, uh, she's 22, and so she set sail from, from L.A. Um, and one of her rewards was for $15. At some point on the trip, she would take a Polaroid. And next time she got into port, she would mail it to you from wherever she was. Um, and so I backed it for this. And about a year and a half later, I get this envelope in the mail. You can see it in the background. You can see the, the Y there for my name. Um, this weird envelope and, uh, and with strange stamps on it. And I open it up, and inside there's a map. And I open up the map, and on one side is uh, it's the South Pacific, and there's a like, magic marker around an island. And on the other side is this letter where she describes to me sitting in a jungle, looking around, seeing the ocean in front of her, and what that moment was like. And then she took a picture, and this is the picture. And so she sent this to me. And, you know, I gave her $15, and I have this. And this is one of my favorite things in the world that I have. And I'm a part of her story. I'm a part of her story. And what she shared wasn't a commodity. It wasn't something that was, like, manufactured or mass-produced. She shared a part of what she's doing in a very personal way. Um, that means a lot to me. And, and that's really the, the best way to approach these things. That's when these things are at their absolute best. 
Um, but you know the, the brass tax of rewards, uh, $25 is the most common pledge that people make. So that $395 million, that has come primarily in $25 increments, which is pretty crazy to think about. And then $100 is the tier that's generated the most money. Um, so people can go from anywhere from $1 to $10,000, uh, but this is not... This is not what it's like to raise money for the walker. You know, this is not getting a lot of people to write big checks. It's a lot of people just giving little amounts of money. Um, and that, having that person involved is just as important as that dollar that you get. Uh, the other thing that's really important with, with projects, the other part, that I, uh, the sort of the two most important pieces are rewards and then, then the project video. Uh, from the very beginning, we'd always base Kickstarter around the idea of a video, be a very video-centric site. We didn't know what people would do exactly. We just thought of videos way more interesting than anything else. Um, and the way project videos have evolved are really interesting. I mean, they're basically commercials by normal people um, that are not commercials. So everyone shows how uncomfortable they are in front of the camera. Like, that's really important to be awkward. Um, if your cat jumps on your laptop during the middle of it, that's a great thing. Don't stop it. Keep it going. Everyone wants to show their authenticity and just the fact that uh, just who they are. They're not selling, they're sharing. They want to show their work to you. They want to invite you to be a, be a part of it. Um, so I want to show you a little mon another little montage of this is the prototypical project video. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. What's up, people? Hi. <laughs> hey. Hello. I thought we were going to do hello. Hi. I love your new shoes. Are those new shoes? Hi, my name is Raquel. Uh... And I could go on, but this is a Kickstarter campaign video, and I haven't even told you what my project is yet. So the idea is this. I'm writing a book. A feature film. Stop motion animations. Sci-fi music video album. Oh. What if you will actually be able to buy a couture dress that they themselves designed? I want to make a new graphic novel, and I want you to get some original art. This time I decided to write things that were more lyrical. I hope to make something strange and unique for you to enjoy. I made a film called Codependent Lesbian Space Alien Seek Same. Right now, I'm sitting on over 200 hours of incredible footage. I'd like your help to complete it. Cut out all that extraneous stuff, all those extraneous costs, and get to the point, which is simply more art in front of more people. The last piece of the puzzle is going to be you. We cannot do this without you. We can't. We need you to be a part of this. This is a collaborative experience. If you back this Kickstarter project, you will be cool and everybody will like you. I want to make a show that you don't just watch. Something unpredictable, strange, and maybe even amazing. So let's do this thing. I'm really excited for this. I think that this is worth doing. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching our Kickstarter. Let's go make a story. We can make it together. So you see a lot of faces, just people just expressing themselves, talking about what they want to do. Um, but the project video has really evolved to become its own form. It is, a, it is its own thing at this point. We're all pretty familiar with, with what they're like, if you, if you look at the site with any regularity. Uh, if you go to YouTube and you search for Kickstarter parody, you'll find about a thousand results. Um, some of them are really good. Uh, and I wanted to show you my favorite right now. This is, from, uh, this is from about a year and a half ago. This was from Funny or Die. My fellow Americans, our country is mired in an economic crisis due to an enormous national debt. Turns out it's hard to figure out how to pay it back. A big old topic. That's why I'm asking you as American citizens to do your part by donating to my new Kickstarter project, The Debt. I know that the Kickstarter is for bad web series ideas and ugly art projects, like a horse made out of wires or something. But we've got a more important project, America, America. With a project goal of $14 trillion, we're asking that you donate what you can so we can fix this thing before we land ourselves in Mad Maxville. We've even got some fine incentives for those donating. Pledge $1 and you get citizen's pride in return. Sorry, but we're broke. We can't afford to just give you things for a dollar. Pledge $50 and you get a nifty flag pin. I don't need it. Pledge $5,000 and I'll let you sit in my big comfy chair in the Oval Office. Just don't touch anything. $20,000 gets you a position in your state house of representatives. <laughs> Pledge 50000 and you get to make a law. Come on, give me a law. Don't like birds? Make a law against birds. I don't know how we'll force that, but it's a law. 100000 lets you be president for a day. You can just come chill in my kick-ass house, call some prime ministers, the whole shebang. 
$1 million gets you executive producer credit on America. I'm not sure what that means, but it will look good on your IMDb. $10 million, and I'll tell you who killed JFK. That's right. I know. $11 million, and I'll tell you who killed JFK, Tupac, and Biggie. Same person. $50 million, and I'll tell you what celebrities are actually extraterrestrial reptilians. That men in black shit is real. $1 billion gets you Joe Biden. You've only got one of those, but let me tell you, he makes a killer calzone. Fourteen trillion, and you get the whole country. It won't be the United States of America, though. It'll be the United States of your name here. Your name's Ron. It's the United States of Ron. During World War II, citizens grew gardens, ration supplies, and bought bonds to aid their country. All you need to do is slip away from Farmville for a sec and click the pledge button. Let's kickstart that debt out of here. And while you're on Kickstarter, head over to my other page, where I'm trying to fund a zombie movie. It's a twist on the genre. Very funny, but also scary. So good. Uh, I want to show an, uh, another an, another video like this one. Um, uh, Portlandia did a skit making fun of Kickstarter um, early this year. Bizarrely, this aired the exact same day as the Double Fine Adventure and the other Million Dollar Project. So that's that's an all time day for us. Um, but but here's here's Portlandia. Uh, we're trying to raise uh, twenty five thousand uh, dollars, and it'll be worth it because it'll be so cinematic and so beautiful. We're going to have a real light built, a sort of uh, that's going to open up and there'll be an elevator with an elevator uh, bellman there saying, uh, last floor, the sun, the lights will dim, but there will be that one lantern. And the lantern will be held by uh, the wise man who knows nothing. She'll come down on a glass staircase. When she touches the glass, we'll realize it's made out of ice. So she'll slip on it, but because she uh, for just a dollar. You get a uh, half price download of half of the song that you'll be able to listen to once. Then for $100, you'll get a set visit. We won't be there, but... Uh, if you've never given to a charity before, I urge you to please contribute. We need to add the message button for the pledge thing. It's a good, it's a good suggestion from Portlandia. Um, so when people are making fun of you, you're, you're doing a good job. I, I, think, I think that's true. Um, and so within Kickstarter, there are a lot of these, the video, there's just, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of memes that carry through. Um, we see a lot of these. There's a lot of pet cameos. We really like to track those. Um, people doing all sorts of weird things. Um, one that we see a lot uh, it started with a, a project called IMI, which is this super long single take walk and talk video. It's kind of like, if you know the very famous Goodfellas scene, the Copacabana scene of the camera moving through the, the kitchen and into a club. Um, things like that. And these are really great to show a whole universe around a project. So here's a little Brady Bunch style view of a, a few of those. So after that happened, I figured I should ask some actors if they wanted to be in the movie. That's what we and I realized I'm started. married to a pretty great actor. To now we're faced well, with a moral battle. Since we're shooting the movie, we need to be able to play some of the characters. Hi, I'm Yancy from Kickstarter. Hi, my name is Yancy. Welcome to Kickstarter. That's how Casper's going. We're also going to be filming. They're never... There have never been any videos like this one. And then there was the one in the middle here by Jocelyn, that's Jocelyn there. And all of a sudden there are a lot of these. And now there are a couple, a couple dozen of videos like this. Um, you can see there are three of those that feature me. Uh, we've made a few videos at Kickstarter and we've adopted this as our house style, as the single long take sort of tour through the office. Um, and I want to show you the, the first one of these we made. It was for a film festival um, that we did because it just shows you what, what the office is like. My name 
is Yancey. Welcome to Kickstarter. We asked you to come here today because we wanted to tell you about the second annual Kickstarter Film Festival that will be happening July 9th, 2011 on a rooftop in Brooklyn, New York, atop of the Old American Can Factory. It's going to be a special night. We really hope you can join us. We're going to be screening videos from Kickstarter projects. We're going to be, all of us are going to be on hand. We're going to show the best and the brightest of what's happened on Kickstarter so far. We did this last year and it was such a success we had to do it again. We're doing it with rooftop films and we couldn't be more excited about it. So I wanted to bring you into the Kickstarter office and let you see how we're getting ready for this year's festival. If you pardon me, we have to keep it down for just a second. Justin's on a call. This is our conference room here. So we've been studiously preparing for this year's festival. We've been watching every single project video. We've been doing... Sorry, we're still working on it right now. But this right here, this is Kickstarter headquarters. Everything happens no, no, here. No, 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 no. From beginning to end, we look at proposals. Yes! Celebrate successful. New Hall of Fame. Looks like they found a winner. So everything that happens at Kickstarter happens here. And this year's festival, we're going to feature 16 films. Documentaries, features, shorts, some project videos, some weird things that we think are really going to blow your mind. If we could just stop right here for just a second. This is my favorite part of the whole office. This is a piece from James Franco's Imaginary Art Project. Is the camera able to pick that up? Do you see? Cool. It's, it's just great. So we've been thinking really hard about how do, we, how do we make this year's festival better than last year's. And you know what we did? We turned to the data and we thought about Let's look at the numbers. Let's analyze how it is that you make the perfect film festival. Let's make a list of all the things that you need to really nail it, and let's make sure we get them exactly right. So we've been working so hard, we've been working tirelessly to make sure that every single piece of this is perfect, just for you. We really hope that you can make it. We've been testing rewards, making sure they meet our standards for what we're looking for. At the festival itself, it's not just movies. There's going to be project creators. There's going to be fenders there, all people who made projects on Kickstarter. It's too hot. We think it's going to be an amazing night, and we really hope that you can be here. There's going to be about 500 people here, all your future friends, all watching great films, all joining you together. But it's almost 9 o'clock. It's time to begin. So please back this project $10 and come join us for the second annual Kickstarter Film Festival. Thank you. Yay! So that was, that was like two years ago, that was the team. We were about 18 people or so then. Um, we had some drinks that night. That was our, th our third try. Um, but that was really fun. That, that's that's, that's kind of what it's like. Um, so this is, the, this is the team again. This is our old team page. I actually wanted to show you guys um, something that we'll be launching tomorrow, which is our new team page. Um, it's really cool. So this is everybody. Um, this is Tomas. Tomas makes all of our videos. This is Chris, he's one of our designers. This is Perry, Perry's our CEO. He's the guy who first had the idea and is uh, one of my best friends. Um, Stephanie, who uh, is the person who brought me first here to Minneapolis. Justin does press. This is Charles, our the other founder. Zach designed the page. He just started. <laughs> <laughs> this is like his second day. Mike wearing some really nice shoes. Uh, this is Nicole. Nicole's holding a statue of herself playing the ukulele that she got as a reward through the site. So I want to make a statue of you for $40. Um, Luke. Luke designs games. Andrew drinking an infinite cup of coffee here over and over. These guys are recreating Socrates here. Uh, so this is the team. This is us. So this is everybody. It's 46 people. Um, so this is this was a lot of fun to make, and this is, you know, this is kind of what it's like. So it's a lot of fun, um, which makes it a good time to say if anyone's looking for a job. Uh, we're hiring a lot of things right now: um, designers, developers, people to to help people with their projects. People do customer service. Um, you have to move to New York, but uh, if you're interested, you can email us jobs at kickstarter.com. Uh, we're a nice group of people. Um, I want to show you one more video before before getting into questions. We really track. Um, as I said, we watch every video and, and we look for trends and we see these kind of super cut ideas, these meta montages, and um, this is one that we recently put together. Oh, hi. Oh. 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 Oh, hi. 
Oh, oh, hey, how's it going there? Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Hi there. I definitely didn't see it come in there. Uh, oh. 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 Oh, hi. Hey. Oh. You've come. Oh. Oh. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. I didn't see it come in there. Oh, hello. Oh, hey. Oh, hi. I didn't feel you there. Enhance. Why would it enhance? Oh, hello. We didn't see you there. Yeah, I bet you think that you interrupted our meeting. But don't worry, you didn't. Mm -mm. We were just acting. <laughs> Uh, so let's get to some questions. Who's got a question? We'll have to wait for the mics to come around. Uh, maybe we'll start there at the top and sort of work our way down. Yes, sir. How's it going? All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here. That was super fun. Um, I, I was curious about, since we're talking about creativity and community and building relationships, I was curious about... Uh, sort of the unspoken relationship between Kickstarter and Amazon and how that uh, has helped build the foundation for making Kickstarter such a success. Yeah, um, so when you, when you back a project on Kickstarter, when you go to, to pay, to put in your credit card, um, you do it through Amazon. So if you are an Amazon user, which something like 200 million people are, um, you just put in your password and check out and it's, it's just like that. Um, you know, we start working with Amazon because what we're doing with the notion of you don't charge everyone immediately and you only charge if a certain threshold has been met, it's a very weird thing and, and not something people had done before. Um, and we were creating it. Amazon had built a new service and they were, uh, they were willing to work with us. They were willing to give it a try. And so for that reason, we built our system through them. So it, it's been a great, a great partnership. Also, like half of the sites on the internet, are, are, our site is hosted on Amazon. It's amazing that Almost like any time you use Netflix, you're using Amazon, um, their EC2 service. Uh, so they're, they've been a great resource and, and, and really important for us getting off the ground. Who's, who's next? Should we go other sides or anything? If someone wants to get queued up over here, maybe we can keep the time moving. So, For sure, yeah. How do you, how do you go from becoming a website to the website? It's three things. Uh, no, I have, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, you know, uh, I think for us, we happen to fit like a real need that people had. And we happen to fit a need for people who talk a lot and are put, like to share their ideas. I mean, when we, We've never bought an advertisement in our life. Um, you know, uh, we've pitched one story for PR ever. Um, it's all just been organic and people telling their friends and it's sort of working its way out through there. So I have absolutely no idea. Um, if it had not clicked for us, uh, you know, we probably would have flopped. We probably would have flopped, but people started using it. Um, so I think the fact that the site's really usable, the fact that it's just a page where people can put themselves into it. So. You know, it's not really dependent on us. We're just sort of there as a, as a vessel for other people is really helpful. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think that we're, we're, the, we're the product of a moment, and we've been very fortunate, and um, I have no idea. I have no idea. Over here, we have a yeah. get someone next over there, too. I'm yeah. mic'd up. Yeah. Um, well, Yancey, th first of all, thanks for coming out. Um, so just had a quick question. Um, you know, I graduated from college. I've been debating getting an MBA in entrepreneurship, kind of, you know, the fancy top 10 school. What are your thoughts on, you know, going that route or kind of just jumping into the innovative circle and, you know? Well, I, I'm going to be the wrong person to ask because I'm going to tell you not to go to school. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that there, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I just, I got an undergrad degree in English and cultural studies. So, you know, it's definitely... I don't know what to tell you about that. It was, it was a great experience, and you know, I believe in institutions. Um, we personally are terrified of, of MBAs. We don't have any MBAs at the site uh, who work for us um, because, I don't know, it feels like you're being trained to have certain values, like to maximize and try to get big, and you know, just things that are less about uh, a mission and a belief system and more about like strategies for extracting certain things. Um, 
uh, you know, I've never, I never thought I was going to be an entrepreneur. Um, I was, you know, maybe always a little bit of a smart ass or something, but I didn't ever think that I would start something of my own. Um, and uh, I don't know, the only train that we have for this, the only thing that we have really guiding us is our gut and just what we believe. Um, you know, I was talking about this earlier at, at MCAD, there's, when you're, when you're doing it, there's like, there's two kinds of problems. There's a the kind of problem that people have faced before, which is like a pattern recognition problem. When a certain thing happens, you do this other thing, and that's how you get through it. Or when you hire your 50th person, you have to hire an HR person because it's going to be a nightmare. There's things like that that are like basic truths that you can learn. And we picked up a lot of those just by reading as many blogs as we could. Um, and just, just trying to learn people who did it. You know, there's, there's people like kind of Jason Fried who runs company 37 Signals who writes a lot about his experience. Uh, a guy named Fred Wilson who um, is one of our investors who is sort of a, a blogging hero for us bef long before we ever met him. And we just read these people and just sort of like try to absorb how it is you're supposed to think about this. But so those kinds of problems, and those are kind of the easy problems of like just the playbook, how do you get through things. Um, but the other stuff is much harder. The other stuff are, are the things where they are your problems. They're problems created by what you've created. And those are things where there is no right answer whatsoever. All you have to go on is, are your principles, your moral values, and your, and your gut. And you, know, you make those instincts, and then you go to home at night, and you feel terrified, not knowing whether or not you made the right call. And sometimes you don't know for like a year. And, and the scary thing is that you make that call and then because you made the call that way, the next day you also make the call that way because it's what you did before and the world didn't fall down. And there's this way that a belief system gets built onto, onto itself and you sort of start to go in a direction. Um, and you want that direction to be guided by what you believe and, and some sort of higher purpose. And so for us, this purpose is that it's really hard to make things and it's really hard to be creative and, and art is way too difficult to get in the world and, and things exist because that they have the ability to make someone money and not because people love them. And maybe there, maybe there should be room in society for a place where ideas can happen just because people think they're good ideas and that's it. And, and so that, that's, what, that's what drives us. And so that, I think that, that makes it easier for us in a lot of ways. I mean, we're in a good, we're in a good position because we have a business model where we, we, if a project's successfully funded, we charge 5% of what they raised as our fee. And through that, we are a sustainable company. Um, everyone has health insurance. We have a nice office. Um, you know, we're doing okay. And, and so that allows us to make decisions based on belief and not based on money, which is a luxury. We, we realize it's a luxury. But after that, then it's just like, then it's just what you really, what you really feel. So if you're sitting at a moment and you're not sure what to do, you know, um, uh, I don't know. If there's something that you really love that you'd like to get involved in, go for it. Um, I think that's certainly the best way to learn. Uh, certainly going through an MBA program at a really good school, you're going to meet a lot of good people. Um, credentials matter at, at larger organizations. Um, and certainly there's some good, good things you can learn. Uh, but my instinct is always just say to try to do something if you can. Um, but I don't know. I, I think that you probably know the right answer to it one way or the other. Certainly school is really valuable. Um, that's just, just my gut on it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. He's got the mic next. Hi. Hello. Um, sorry. This might be an obvious or silly question, but how do you ensure that the funding or money is actually going towards the project itself and not for something that else? That is not a silly question. That's a very good question. Um, so yeah, so how, how do we know the money is being used the way that they say it is? Um, and we don't. We don't. I mean, fundamentally, Kickstarter is an honor system. Um, you put out an idea, you say you're going to do this thing, and people give you money so that you're going to do this thing, and, and everyone's just sort of agreeing. There are legal obligations created when you start a project, um, but still, it's, it's, it's fundamentally based on trust. And, but the reasons why it works based on that is that when you launch a project, the vast majority of your backers are going to be people that you know. Maybe not personally know, certainly a lot of them, but maybe people in your network or people who liked your work before who are supporting your next thing. And those are people that you can't afford to screw over. You know, those are people that if you burn those bridges, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have a lot of trouble in life. You know, it's not just Kickstarter at that point. It's life. It's like you have nowhere to go for Thanksgiving forever. Um, maybe that's better. Maybe that's, maybe that's the wrong example. Um, but... But so there, there are these social forces that really push people in the direction of being accountable. Um, but we also know, you know, we, we try to 
present people information on the page that you can kind of read projects in a certain way. So pretty high up we have the, the creator's bio and links that they share and you can see how they present themselves. We ask people to Facebook connect to verify their identity. Um, and we try to make as much of the history obvious as we can. But there's also, I think, a, a gut feeling that you get when you launch a project, or when, when, sorry, when you, when you look at a video. You could just feel who's sincere and who's not. Um, I think a lot of that, you know, 56% of projects aren't funded. Um, many of those are very worthy, and, and I wish they would get funded, but a lot of them are maybe weren't funded for a reason. Um, so, you know, to date there have been 75,000 projects launched, 32,000 have been funded. Um, I don't know, I think that I can say this is true, I don't know if anyone's like taking the money and run in a scam kind of thing. Um, I'm sure it will happen, there's no way it can't not happen, you know, with, with a thing this big and this many people doing things. Um, people certainly do struggle and projects won't work out the way they anticipated, but the way that we see that happening um, more frequently, but still very, very rarely, is that just people get in over their heads. The thing they want to do is a little harder than they thought. And, um, and I think that's something we can all understand as long as someone is, is honest and transparent about it and just talks about what's going on. You know, you do that the right way, people are going to be like, yeah, this is hard, you know, sorry, sorry it worked out that way. And, you know, if I gave you $25 and I saw a train wreck of you trying to make a movie for six months, that might still be a pretty good $25 I spent because that's, <laughs> that's kind of entertaining. Um, and so just being transparent and talking very honestly about what's going on is definitely the, the way to go. And so we really try to build, we're trying to build the system and continue to, to, to encourage people for just to be radically transparent all the time. Talk about process. Process is so important because it's something that's hidden from us. When, when we're all consumers and we're just shopping, we, you don't see any of the things that came into something. Like no item on a shelf has an author. It's just a thing that magically exists somehow. And you don't really think about how. I always think about, you know, I have, I have Amazon Prime. Um, and Amazon Prime, you order something, it shows up on your doorstep two days later. And it is like magic. It is like magic. And, and it's amazing. It's amazing. But there's a way that that's really wrong because it doesn't, you don't think about where anything comes from. You know, you think that people are plucking things off trees and throwing them in boxes, and it's just, that's it. But the answer is that everything that gets made, there's an incredibly long process and many, many points of refinement, and a lot of people putting a lot of energy into making something happen. Um, and Kickstarter is all about that process, all about that process. You know, Amazon is about fast delivery. Kickstarter is about the slowest delivery possible. <laughs> you know, because you're, you're supporting something that probably doesn't exist yet. You are bringing it into existence. And, you know, it's an unpredictable process, but I think there's a lot of fun in that. It's a lot more fun to create than it is to shop. So, who's next? Hello. Hi. Um, I'm wondering what might be next for Kickstarter, if you're going to keep on keeping on, or if you have uh, another idea in mind, and just in case you need one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've thought about this a lot, and the difference is you actually did your idea, uh, of going back to something more like the artist-patron model of the Renaissance, where a patron sticks with an artist for maybe even their lifetime, mm -hmm. simply because they believe in the artist and they like what they do. And it can be, you know, a little bit of money or a lot of money. It can be whatever arrangement. I think the problem is connecting up those people. Right. And I'm, and I'm wondering if, if, if something along that line has ever crossed your mind or if you have another idea and Kickstarter is going to go someplace else now. Well, I think this is that. I mean, you know, Karen said before, this is patronage of the 21st century, and we think a lot about patronage. You know, you think a lot about um, that process. And patronage used to be the province of kings and the church and really, really rich people, and now it can be anybody. Um, and so, you know, the way that it spreads through a network is, you know, the magic of the Internet. And, and people are coming together around these things and, and creating them. So we, we think this is patronage. It's, it's a mix of, of patronage and commerce because there is also a return. Uh, you're getting something. And so in between that and, and the melding of those two things is Kickstarter. And we're trying to find a path that, that, that is in between those things and, and really create a, a new type of transaction, something that is not shopping, it's not giving, it's creating. With your money, you're creating. Um, and, you know, that's something that will take time to try to, to try to cement. And we're still figuring out the right ways to define it and to talk about it. Um, in terms of uh, our other great ideas, um, this is it. It's a one-shot deal. <laughs> We feel all right about the time, you know, you know, we did okay. Um, you know, we have no plans for Kickstarter to be anything different than what it is. Um, we did it because the dream was to help people create 
art and creative things, and it's worked. And now we have to not screw it up, and uh, we have to make it a little bit better every day. So thinking about better ways for the site to work, if people interact with it, make it a little more fun. Um, and that's what we're spending our time on. That and then, and then building a system of governance around it. You know, you make something like this in a certain point, um, it is a society. It's a society, and, like, you have to write the Federalist Papers for it, you know. You have to figure out how it works, and you have to build the laws and the principles that organize it. And so we're figuring that stuff out now, and that stuff's really hard really fun. Um, and so, you know, our feeling is that in five or ten years, Kickstarter will look pretty much exactly the same. Exactly the same, and, you know, don't screw it up. Don't screw it up. <laughs> Uh, who's next? Up there. Hello, sir. Hi. Um, I had a question. Is there some type of like implied ownership to projects that are on Kickstarter? So like to avoid anyone kind of ripping off the idea either bigger companies or smaller size companies? No, there's not. There's not. Uh, I mean, if you have previously like copywritten or, or patented something you put up, you know, those, those protections would stand. But no, I mean, you're, you're putting an idea out there in the world and you're accepting the risk that comes from that. Um, but uh, I think that what happens is that you claim you're claiming that idea is yours, sort of morally and in public. Um, and you know, as we know, ideas it's all about pulling them off. Um, so you're certainly taking a risk. Uh, in terms of the other kind of ownership, you know, there is no ownership of a project if you put money into it. I'm not buying points on it or something. I'm not buying stock into it. I think there's an emotional ownership that is even more important. Um, but there is no equity changing hands or anything like that in, in any sort of instance. Um, there's actually a, a, a law that the president signed back in April called the Jobs Act. Um, that legalized equity-based crowdfunding. So what that means is you could use something like Kickstarter to buy a share in Double Fine Adventure or in uh, a, the next Facebook, things like that. Um, and this law was pushed through because of Kickstarter. You know, people were talking about Kickstarter on, on the floor of the house, and that was really weird. Um, <laughs> no one talked to us, of course, uh, but, uh, but they talked about us. Um, but that's not something that we're going to do. Um, you know, uh, we think that what's really exciting and disruptive about Kickstarter is that these things are happening not because people want to make money, but just because they want to do it. And that when you put in that other aspect of trying to make money, you're kind of recreating the world we already have. And I'm sure it'll work for some people, but it's just not the thing that we set out to do. Over here. Can you talk about uh, projects that are overfunded? Mm -hmm. you have issues with that, what, like a project that has X budget and it gets 10X. Right. Uh, you know, what about that? Yeah, so, so projects don't shut off uh, when you hit your goal. So if I'm raising 10 grand, when I hit 10 grand, it's not like it goes ding, 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 and, you know, we're, we're all winners. The projects continue until their deadline. Um, and uh, huge sums of money end up getting amassed because there's this momentum that comes with the project. Just money begets money begets bunny. And so, the, the, so for example, the first project to cross a million dollars ended up raising $1.5 million. Its goal was $60,000. So a little bit better than that. Um, the project called the Pebble that raised $10.2 million, its goal was $100,000. And so you see these things get much, much larger. And uh, when you're trying to, to produce a physical object, that makes things much tougher. You know, there's an economy of scale to manufacturing. The more you make, theoretically, the cheaper things get and things like that. But, uh, but also the, the, your skill level has to increase a lot. You go from something you're planning to make with your buddy in his garage or down like the local tech shop, and suddenly you're manufacturing like a supply chain from China. And you know, you sort of wake up and you're like, all right, I'm a I didn't didn't intend to be, but I'm now a businessman who's like really running some stuff. Um, and that brings real challenges. And there's a there's a a, a real leap that you have to make. And we see those projects definitely have a have a tougher time. Um, because their initial plan of what they had wanted to do has just no is no longer tenable, and as those dollars are increasing, it all seems like gravy or like amazing. You know, why would you shut that off? It's really really exciting, uh, but it definitely brings with it some real challenges. Um, and so, you know, we have no intention of changing our rules or anything like that. We, you know, creators are aware they can mark things as sold out if they want to. We actually had a project do that pretty recently that raised over a million dollars and then just shut itself off with another two months to go. They were like, we want to do this right. Um, we were glad to see that. That would be a, a, a nice model for others to follow. Um, but when it comes to producing these physical goods, the, the scale really changes things a lot. If I'm making a movie and I get a ton more money than expected, that doesn't change anything. Manufacturing a DVD is not difficult. Um, the challenge in, in every other category on the site is, is an intellectual challenge. It's writing a good script and 
and setting your scenes well and writing a great bass line and all these kinds of things. Um, but when it comes to stuff that's manufactured, the whole challenge is in making something. It's turning atoms into an object, you know, and delivering them around the world. I mean, that is an insane thing to try to do and if you really think about it. Um, so yeah, it becomes much, much more difficult. Uh, but you know, these people are, they're plugging away. They're plugging away. There's um, Dan and Tom who did this, these two projects called the, the Glyph and the Cosmonaut. They did a talk at MCAT about a month ago. They're a really early Kickstarter success story. They're also good friends of ours. And they have this line about how for them doing these projects was jumping off a cliff and then building a parachute on the way down. I don't encourage you to do that. <laughs> uh, know what you're doing as much as you can, but it, it does get into that territory when, when things really blow up. Who's got the mic up top? Hi, Yancy Strickler. You have a cool name. Welcome to Minneapolis. My name Thank is you. Marcus Harkis. Mine is a little cooler, Marcus Harkis. That's, you win. Uh, you definitely win. I have a project now. If you wouldn't mind backing that, I'd appreciate it. All right. All right. But my question is, it's two parts. Are there any uh, internet-based funding models that don't fund creative projects that you admire? Mm -hmm. And then for the creative ones, I just heard of Indiegogo. How do mm -hmm. you deal with that competition? Yeah, the, the one that I would cite is as, um, I mean, there's, there's Kiva is one that is for, you know, entrepreneurs in developing countries. Those are microloans. Um, that's a really great one. There's another one uh, called Donors Choose that's just for schools. And those are actually really good friends of ours. Um, so those are two that I really like a lot. At this point, there are, um, when we started, there were a handful of sites out there doing things like Kickstarter. Um, when Perry first had the idea, there weren't any. Um, and the whole time we're working on it, we're, we always lived in this fear of waking up one day and seeing like someone finally launch Kickstarter. Someone had the idea and that we'd have to go figure out what we're going to do with the rest of our lives. Um, but that never happened. And so, you know, uh, now when we launched, there are a couple. Now there are about three or 400 um, in a lot of different countries focusing on uh, a lot of different niches. Um, you know, every day you hear someone launch Kickstarter for books and we're like, there is a Kickstarter for books, you know. Um, but... Uh, but what's interesting about those things is that, you know, the goal of the site is for more, for more creative work to exist, for more money to go into art, for more things to be able to happen. And that doesn't mean just on Kickstarter. That doesn't mean just on Kickstarter. Um, we wish all these other sites well. And, and, you know, if someone is having success using them, we think that's awesome because that's something else that gets to exist in the world that maybe wouldn't have otherwise. Um, you know, the one thing I'll say for all the other sites is they all look like Kickstarter. Um, they all act like Kickstarter. I've... I wrote our fact and I've read it, translated it into many, many different languages on other sites. Um, and so a lot of people are just sort of riffing on what we're doing, uh, which is fine. I'd love to see someone really take it in a different direction, think about it in a different way, because this is just one, this is just one application of this idea, one way to think about it. Um, but I, I think that this model of, of, of sort of a collaborative funding people coming together is, is one that makes a lot of sense. It just, it just makes a lot of sense, and I think it's pretty transferable to a lot of things. So I think we'll see Kickstarter for small businesses and Kickstarter for pet surgeries and, you know, who knows what. Who knows what. Anything and everything. Uh, and I look forward to seeing them. I look forward to seeing them. Who's up next? Up here. Hi, Yancey. My name is Leah. I interviewed you the other day. Hey, nice, um, nice to see you. And now that I'm out of the work environment, I thought I'd ask you an out-of-the-box question. Um, so I lived in NYC this past summer, and um, it was good. I want to make my life there. And I've had a drink at the Pencil Factory Bar. I think that's right across the that street. That is across from, the street. Yeah. Um, so now, today, the job market is tough and you really need to to show how you stand out like how you're special um, and I have a lot of skills we can talk about those later but um, I graduate from the U in the spring so you want to hire me yeah <laughs> you know you should you should emails maybe I'll use this so I um, I end up interviewing a lot of people and reading a lot of resumes and doing a lot of screening around that and um, and I have tips for how to get a job uh, I'll just get into that. I wrote a long blog, blog post about this once because a lot of people do it really wrong. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're writing into a company to, to try to get a job, um, never make your cover letter an attachment. 
Your cover letter should always be about three or four paragraphs. The first paragraph should be maybe two sentences saying why you're really excited to be a part of this thing. If you can sincerely say that, just sincerely say what you think. If you don't sincerely feel that, fake it as best you could. Um, second paragraph, just talk about what's interesting about you. Some, a lot of it should be work-related, but some of it can be personality-based. But just really just try to express who you are very simply. Um, and then again, just express you know, why you want to be a part of this and what it is that you think you contribute. And you know, when we look at, when we look at, at, at applications that come in, people writing in, we very rarely look at resumes. Very rarely. We're mostly just reading these letters. And I think we're probably unique in that way. Um, but we're just reading these cover letters and just seeing, like, this person seems cool. Let's talk to them. They seem really nice. Um, and, that, and that's really the way that we approach it. Um, like triple check everything for any typos or anything weird. Uh, twice in my life I have hired people with typos somewhere that I overlooked. I was like, ah, it's probably nothing. And it was something. It was something. Um, we also get a lot of resumes that begin Dear Twitter or Dear Facebook. So, you know, check your find and replace. Uh, but, but, you know, people should write in with these things just trying to express themselves very honestly about why it is they want to do this thing. I think, I think that will generally catch people's eye. Um, so for you, you know, a fre fresh grad in the spring, that's a lot of who we hire. Um, so you should email the jobs at Kickstarter. Yeah, I could talk to you afterwards, but sure, yeah, reach out. Who else? Over here. All right. Yancy, thanks for the uh, the talk. It's been super helpful and um, and interesting. You know, it's fun seeing those big numbers getting hit, and I'm sure a lot of people who are here have been following your uh, your company's growth and maybe even seeing some of those those news headlines. Um, and uh, I, but I'm guessing a lot of people that are here um, are interested in that like art artistic entrepreneurship. It's mm -hmm. you know we aren't like the the Tim Schafers or the Obsidian developers, but uh, just trying to find ways to um, meet modest goals that that would really help us like make these projects real. Um, and and your website, there's there's information. It's it's you know, it's helpful. It, you really do get the sense that Kickstarter is there to you know to help because everyone is you know everyone, everyone benefits when people are successful on this on this platform. But I guess my question is um, for these modest projects, how and uh, maybe how is the the, the website? Working with individuals to get it past their own social networks uh, is do you see these these sort of like tipping point moments where suddenly it it is bigger than than asking these these uh, these people that we're indebted to because we know them and uh, and breaking into that larger exciting maybe overwhelming like open market of, yeah. of uh, people who want to help and and collaborate for sure yeah that's I mean that's that's what everyone of course wants you know there's there is the incredible emotional gratification that comes from people that you know and love demonstrating love for you especially when it's like your high school girlfriend and you're like what's up um, <laughs> so it's, there's always those moments uh, but uh, but you know what's funny is that uh, you know we tell people that whenever they start a whenever they start a project to um, assume you're not getting any money from anyone outside of like people who you think would probably be in. Um, and so just assume that way, because what you're going to find is that the first maybe half of your, half of your budget, half your money is really going to come from your network, um, from people you know, from people, friends of friends, through Facebook, Twitter, all email. Email is the most important by far. When, you, when you're emailing people about your project, don't do a blast to your whole address book. Write individual emails to each, each person. Spend the extra couple of days to do it. It makes a huge difference. Um, but what we found is that you know there are millions of people who come to Kickstarter every week who are browsing projects, and um, and about twenty five percent of the money has come from those folks, and and those people are much more likely to get involved in things that seem to have momentum, things that are sixty percent funded, fifty percent funded, um, and, and they're more likely to put money in. So that existing money will validate your project to them and make it seem like this is real. And, and so that's a good way to sort of to get things primed for it to go off. Um, you know, we look at every project that launches, as I said before, and things that just strike us that we're just, we just think this is cool and exciting. We, and, and cool and exciting doesn't mean like this is going to blow people's minds. It's just like this is, this person's awesome. This person's awesome. This thing is like we we love this. We love this, and we make it a staff pick. And ultimately, staff pick doesn't mean a whole lot. 
It means there's one part of the site where you can browse them. Uh, interestingly, that doesn't get that much traffic. Um, most of the traffic is to like location pages or people looking at what's just launched or people looking at what's ending in the next three days. Stuff like that ends up drawing more of the clicks. Um, so there's, there is definitely that Kickstarter audience that can be there. Um, but really what you're doing is, you know, the audience you're playing in is just the web. It's just the web. Um, you know, press is a huge driver of things. Your friends are huge drivers of things. And, you know, it's hard because you're, you are basically having to learn how to do PR on the fly. And if you are uh, uh, a normal person, you have never done anything like that before, and thank God for that. Um, but it's not an easy thing. And, you know, the thing that, I, that we see people do that I think is a little bit wrong is they try to ramp themselves up into, like, into the, a machine, into, like, a well-oiled machine that's doing these things. And certainly you have to do it's – it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. But you always have to be you. You know, your greatest asset is, you know, I'm just some guy. I'm just some guy. I'm just some girl doing this thing that I believe in. And that's, that's what it's really going to strike a chord with people, whether it's people you know or, or the press or the web or whatever. And, you know, running a project, is, it, it, it'll give you some gray hairs. It'll make your heart race a little bit. It's, you'll cry more than once. You will. You will. And it's a really emotional experience, both good and bad. Um, but you're going to come out from the end knowing that you put your idea out in the world and that you know what people think of it, pretty honestly. Um, and maybe at the end you get to do it. And that's sort of the risk that you take. Um, but, you know, having a live project up is an excuse to talk about your passion. You know, you always want to talk about your passion. You're always looking for an end to drop it into conversation. And it's always, it's always awkward. But here you have a real thing, and people can do something about it. Um, and so treat it as that moment. You know, it's, it's not easy. It, it's, it's certainly not easy. But it is, it is work worth doing. It is incredibly gratifying. And um, I really don't think I've talked to anyone ever uh, who said that they regretted doing it. I really haven't. Even people who didn't work out. Um, and I think they felt like... You know, they put this thing in the world. I mean, it's the thing that we do. We have these ideas and then we throw them away before we even try them because we think they're impractical or like I never fall through on things or I'll never have time. And so you, these bursts of, of imagination that someone gives you, that, that the heavens give you, that, that you pull out of the air, you have this thing and then you just sort of throw it away because it, seems, it just seems inconvenient or too hard or just that's not how our lives are organized. And so we like Kickstarter as this place where you can just put it up, share with the world, see what people think. Even if everyone tells you that it's terrible, um, there's still that moral victory of, of, of you offered it to the world to see what it thought. Um, and we really think that there's a, 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 a great morality in that. So give it a shot. Hi. Hi, former Brooklynite. Um, I'm curious, and you might have just answered this, but is there any kind of jurying or vetting process that you do for projects? Because obviously everybody in this room has some concept and dream in mind that they want to fulfill, mm -hmm. and this is international, and you've got a staff of 48, you said. So how do you filter all of these fanta fantastic ideas? I, you know, I'm getting a sense that there's a vibe and an energy that you connect and that everything is sort of on a gut level, that this mm -hmm. is a really beautiful process that you mm -hmm. want to see succeed. But with that inundation of information, how do you deal with it? Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, so we get about 350 products a day submitted to us. And so when you build a project, you submit to Kickstarter for review. Um, and what that means is that a person is going to look at it. And um, we're looking at it not to curate enough to make any pass any aesthetic judgment. You know, we've never told anyone to like lose 10 pounds or rewrite the ending or anything like that. Um, you know, we look at projects to make sure they meet our guidelines. And this means that everything is a project, so it has a clear beginning and end. It's not like fund my career. Um, that it fits one of our categories to so something creative, and that's not charity or these other things. We also don't allow porn or weapons or things like that, so we have to check for that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so people submit their projects. Uh, about a day later, they hear back from someone saying yes or no. Um, and, you know, close to 80% of projects are accepted. The things that aren't are things that, you know, fall according to these rules. There's also a lot of gray area things that are tough. You know, there's, there's a lot of ones that we really have to debate because our default is yes. Uh, but the interesting challenge, and this is, this is probably the hardest thing that we face as an organization, is that, you know, we've created a place that the whole idea is that it's, it's opening up opportunity to everybody to make things. No gatekeeper, it's just wide open door. Um, and we really believe in that very deeply. But yet at the same time, you kind of have to protect this thing. 
because it's very dangerous. It's like a money magnet. And, you know, once you get money involved, a lot of the worst parts of us can come out. And so you have to protect it. And, and our instincts are that we don't really want to, but we feel we have to. And so, um, and so we do look at these projects. I mean, every day I'm trying to figure out a way where this is, doesn't have to be part of the process. Um, because people get intimidated by it, but the answer is it shouldn't be intimidating. Every time I see someone tweet, you know, oh my God, my project was accepted, I'm happy for them, but I'm like, ugh, I wish that that didn't have to be part of this, that you didn't have to have the nail biter from Kickstarter, because we were just filled with love for these things. Um, so if you look at pro, you know, if you look at comics, it's like, I think 99.8% of comics are accepted. Games, it's like 95%. Films, it's like about 95%. Um, and the only places where it's really low, technology is like 20% because everyone's pitching their startups. Um, and we're like, that's not a project. You know, a company and a project is something a little different. Um, and, and product design is something that we get a lot of like sham wows. And we're like, sorry, sham wows, just, you know, just not what this is about. And so you kind of have to make these calls and, and act as a little bit of a gatekeeper in these ways. And we feel terrible about it feel terrible about it. And we want to figure out ways where it doesn't have to happen because it feels, it feels intellectually inconsistent. Um, and we're still figuring that out, and hopefully someday we will. Um, but, but that's the process. But if you're submitting something, you're making art, you're doing anything creative, you are talking to friends. You are talking to friends. You're talking to people who want you to succeed, who they're going to write back and say, this is awesome. You should think about these three things. We can't wait to see it. And there's a decent chance that one of your first backers will be someone from Kickstarter. There's a decent chance that would be true. And, um, and so, you know, I wish that there wasn't this hurdle, but to keep it what it is, it's the best way we can figure out how to do it for now. What else? Over here. Hi. Um, this so, is the last question. Oh, last question. Okay. This tension I hope this gets doesn't, ratcheted up. Yes, it does. I hope this doesn't leave it on a negative note because that's not my, my intention, but. Um, I see a lot of live performances, and there's nothing more lovely than going to performance and coming out of it and feeling like, wow, that was magic. And it's so wonderful to see something amazing, and I don't know how they did that. It was just amazing. But I also really love being able to go to a performance and at the end of it go, well, that kind of didn't work. <laughs> because as an artist, I can look at it and go, okay, well, why didn't that work? What can I learn from that? And, and so those are the performances that I learn the most from. And so being privy to all of these projects that come through Kickstarter, I'm wondering if you could give us a little glimpse of patterns that you've noticed or things that you've noticed that, um, that just for whatever reason, not because they don't have heart or not because they don't have a lot of hard workers behind them, uh, things that just don't work out. Sure. Um, well, I'll start off with a shocking statistic. <laughs> Pay attention. 12% uh, of all projects never get a single pledge. 12%. Um, what that means is those are people who didn't even tell mom about it. <laughs> and, and so the, the number one mistake people make is they put it up and they wait for the internet to just make it rain on them. And <laughs> that world does not exist yet. That world does not exist yet. It would be nice if it did. Uh, so that is the number one mistake people make. Uh, you know, people are sometimes greedy. They ask for too much money. Um, we see a lot of projects charging like $500 for a DVD, you know, sorry, you're not PBS. Um, <laughs> no offense to PBS. Uh, and so things like that, I, I think, are mistakes that people make. Um, yeah, and those, and those are, I don't know, uh, I just kind of think if those are mistakes you're making, you're not that serious about this. And you're not thinking about this in the exact right way, and maybe it's okay that, you did, that this thing didn't work out. It just wasn't meant to be. Um, I want to switch gears and talk about something else really quick before we end. Uh, there's a, there's a, we did a thing like a month ago. Maybe some of you saw it. Um, we we wrote a, we wrote a blog post on the site called Kickstarter is not a store, and it was a really interesting. It was well, I, I will say something we wrote is interesting. Uh, it was it was a really interesting thing. Um, you know, there there have been a lot of press recently talking about um, what happens when products don't fulfill. And, and what happens to Kickstarter at that moment? Does, does someone pop the balloon? Does everyone take their things and go home? Um, and, and there's a real fervor around that. And, and we really felt like this was kind of fundamentally misunderstanding what this thing is. Um, and and the, the opening sentence of this, of this post 
um, was we don't know how many people think they're shopping at a store when they come to Kickstarter, but we want to make sure that it is no one. And, and then we walked through a few changes that we made, and, and we instituted a few things. We asked every project to answer a risks and challenges section. So talk about what's going to be hard to do. Uh, for some projects, it's very applicable. For all the music projects, they treat it as a joke. They're like, well, our bass player is a drunk. You know, it's things, <laughs> things like that, which is fine. That's fine. It's a great, it's a great answer. For bands, that is the problem. Um, <laughs> Uh, we also changed specifically for hardware and product design projects. And these are the ones that people were sort of having a shopping kind of mentality. Um, we made a couple of rule changes for them. We said they weren't allowed to show any photorealistic renderings. So what we were seeing projects doing is that they were, they were using Photoshop and other uh, applications that a lot of you probably know better than I do, um, where you can make, some, make a real life object or what looks like one very easily. And so people were presenting these objects, and people were looking at them and measuring the drapes and imagining what it's like in their home. But the truth is it didn't even exist yet. It didn't even exist yet. And, and so there's something about that that's just really weird. And, um, and so we banned that. We said, you cannot do this anymore. This is, this is, this is unfair. And the other thing we did is we said, no product simulations are allowed. And a product simulation would be someone is like, I don't know, has a piece of cardboard box and they act like it's a phone and they're talking into it and they're, they're presenting things that they hope the thing will do but that it can't do yet. And we also felt like that was a little dishonest. And you know we made these changes after reading, I, I spent a weekend reading um, uh, the FCC's truth in advertising laws and, and this idea that you know when you watch a commercial why is it that it says like driver on closed course or those kinds of things and they do this to try to keep advertising honest but it's always such fine print and you still see an awesome car driving around these curves really fast so you know the fine print doesn't work the fine print doesn't work it's there for them to cover their asses but it doesn't work what the fundamental thing is and the image is just too powerful so instead we just said let's get rid of let's get rid of these images let's try to return advertising to like the 19 teens before there was like Edward Bernays and all these things and when an advertisement was like this is a sweater it is made of wool it was made by a woman it will keep you warm enjoy our sweaters you know and it was just it's just here's the thing here's the thing here's how it was made that's it that's it you know advertising and these things have just have become so much about selling and it's become corrupting. You're just buying, you're buying dreams. And, and Kickstarter is so much about dreams, and dreams are really important. But you want to buy into the dream something that is being made and not a dream that doesn't exist yet. And not, not a dream that someone is, is acting like it exists and it doesn't. Um, and so we put these changes up, and, and, and the Kickstarter community got, got pretty upset about it. Got pretty upset about it. A lot of creators felt like we were tying their hands behind their back. Um, a lot of backers felt like, well, how am I supposed to know what to buy if I don't know how it looks? And, um, and we were like, that's, yeah, that's exactly the point. Um, but we felt really proud of that. We felt really proud of that because it, it, we felt expressed in a principle of what we believe. Um, it costs us a lot of money, I'm sure. You know, a lot of projects can't use Kickstarter because we put these rules up there. It set a slightly higher barrier to entry. Um, not really, just says show your work, be honest. And, and we're going to try to do more things over time to just reinforce those ideas and to try to make this a place where people are just expressing themselves transparently. No one's trying to get someone else over on anyone else. Um, these are just communities coming together and trying to make things. And we're really proud of that as being part of what we do. Um, so you know, I thought that might come up tonight, and I kind of want to talk about it. So I just want to mention that. Um, but I guess we're, we have to end soon now, I guess. I guess. So you want to have a really good question that we can sneak in before they cut off the lights? He had a really emphatic hand up. This is going to be awesome. And he's wearing a tie. Yes, you do. We're breaking the rules, guys. All right. Uh, I'm a fellow young entrepreneur, and I've found that to get my business off the ground, you know, once you reach a certain size, sometimes you have to work with people who don't necessarily understand what your definition of good is. You know, you started your business because you wanted to bring good things into the world and do good things for people. And sometimes in order to accomplish that good, you have to work with people that you might be scared that they don't believe like that your good is the same as their good. And they might do bad things or they might you're like you're worried about that. So how do you I can already answer this question. Don't work with it. those people. <laughs> no, well but sometimes Don't work with those people. Even even if even if you can smooth things out now, that is a problem. 
that is a problem. If, if, if you make it work now, you're just trading a bigger problem later. Um, it's just not, it's not going to work. It's not, not necessarily work. that they're bad people. I know. It's, it's just... not that they're bad people, but just you have, to, you have to share a vision. You have to be aligned. These things, all these little things come up. I and mean, this is this interesting thing that I realize when, when you look, at, when you look at, at businesses or companies or organizations, they are, they are such a clear manifestation of their leadership. It's so weird. Like the personalities of who they are somehow come through in all these ways, and it's uncanny. It's uncanny. It seems really, really odd. Uh, but with time, I've really realized how true that is. And so if there is a disagreement or if there are like core ways that, that things don't align, it's going to come up and it's going to be a problem. And you're going to end up wrestling with each other and fighting each other rather than trying to make something happen. Um, so, you know, I would just say move on. Don't risk it. It's, don't, it, it's not even about risk. It's just like that's not going to be fun. That's not what you want to do. It should what be fun. What if that means you can't accomplish the good that you were set out to achieve? Like what if that means that this never would have happened? You got it. Well, I don't know. I Is don't it know worth it? if it's. Uh, I can't tell you if it's their idea or if you know it's a joint idea. I don't know what exactly to tell you, but that will be a problem. That will be a problem. Okay. Um, I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, sure. Uh, all right, this is the last one, and then we're going to go and do other things. <laughs> this man over here. It was another emphatic hand. Everyone's beating the traffic. Uh, one, um, will Kickstarter ever go public? And two, I know we talk about you're expressing about you know supporting love, love. I mean the arts. Yeah. But some of the brands we love today is about money. Apple, the Facebook, yeah. Twitter, Polo. Would they exist if they wasn't for venture capitalists? Like, could they exist if they just did crowds, crowdfunding? That's a good question. Um, uh, IPO, no, no. We have no interest in doing that. Our our plans are to be a an a independent company forever. Um, you know, we'll have to figure out how, how to do that the right ways, but uh, no, we have no goal to do anything like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, venture capitalists play an important part of this, and money is obviously an important part. And if you're trying to do something like Apple and make hardware, there's, you need a lot of money. Something like we do is a little easier because it's just, I, I don't even understand what it is that we do fundamentally. <laughs> And we're able to do it. So that tells you everything. My mom asked me, she's like, what is the coding like? And I'm like, I don't know. They have black screens and green text. I can't. It's about, it's about all I could tell you. You should not be like me. That is, that is a problem. Uh, but certainly, you know, for a lot of these things, you do need a lot of money. And, and the interesting thing is that um, with that money comes a lot of strengths. A lot of strengths. You know, you take a big check from somebody and there is, you know, there's a phone call at the other end of that check. That check is, there's an expectation that's created. Um, and, and that's always there. So it's something that you have to balance. It's something you really have to think carefully about. Um, you know, we're, we're fortunate in that the, the investors that we have uh, who are friends and family um, and then uh, and then the uh, guy named Fred Wilson who's a uh, venture capitalist in New York who's one of the first people in Twitter and Tumblr and things like that. And he's also just a really, really good guy. But he, you know, he has expectations too. Um, but, but we're, we're such a, we're a really mission driven company as, uh, you know, as much as we can be. And, um, and, and everyone's sort of aligned behind those ideas of just like, just try and do something great as, as well as we can. Um, so yeah, the money's, money's tough. Money's tough. And some money's more expensive than others. Um, and, you know, you just have to be prepared for what those things mean. Um, all right, I think, I think we'll wrap up now. I, I would just say, you know, if anyone's interested in starting a project, um, give it a shot. Poke around the site, see how it feels. Um, you can email us, support at Kickstarter. I'm Yancey at Kickstarter. Uh, we're happy to help you. Um, but I don't know. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for being interested in the site at all. It's really nice to meet you guys. Thank you.